Okay, I, my name is Clarence Stevens. I was born in a little village of New Salem on a, on a farm. I was one of 14 kids, which I am now the last one in life. I'll, I'll be 90 years old in September. And, uh, and then I'm going to be the oldest one in the whole family. I was I was drafted. In fact, I I was <laughs> I was called twice. At first, I was working in Pontiac, GM out there. I had my draft papers transferred out there, so I come back to Grand Rapids after I got laid off out there, and went to work for Fox to look for you. So I worked there three months. Well, then in Allegan County called me again. And that's the time I went in, and then uh, uh, I think it was the 15th of November of 42. Went to Little Rock, Arkansas for my basic training. I was there, I guess it was six weeks, 13 weeks. Then from there I went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, which was an officer training camp. And we had to teach all these big, high-ranking officers what to do, how to do it, which is fun. You know, we, they, they, they couldn't give us any crap because we was boss. <laughs> and enjoy it. I stayed we there until March. We probably can know it was March fourth or fifth or something of forty-four, which we got. Start getting shipped out for overseas. We went from Georgia to Massachusetts to Maryland. And when I was in Maryland, I met my neighbor, neighbor girl, Arlene, Arlene Weber, who was Eldon's brother, if you know him, Eldon's sister. Sitting in the mess hall of the, the, the there was Roy sitting across the table with me. Hey, he says, I know you. So you know, then we know we watched me talk, enjoyed it. And it took us two weeks to get on to go get across the lake oh, in a transport ship. And you think that was fun? You should have been on a ship. How many guys were on the ship? They call it a transport, you know, big transport to just just small ship. And that thing with bones and tip and roll and whatever, it's like crazy. And the restrooms were up in front end, the point of the boat. And you went up there and sat down and you the water and up and keep splashing and <laughs> splashing in the butt. <laughs> It was fun. It was fun, but it was part of, part of life, you know. So, so in the meantime, we just went down. I was sick from, from day two to the day I landed. Doing nothing but throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Couldn't hold nothing down. Seasick. And we landed in, in Scotland, and then we got there. We got he transported us right into England. To a little bit of town of Yeovil. That's where you had to be these huts right here. If you, if you, if you see that, that's what we lived in there for, oh, for quite a while. And they transferred me and a few other guys. Uh, what was the name of the town? It's the University of England. Yeah, Univers of Oxford, University of Oxford. Oxford. At the outside of London, we were there. We lived in the college, in the college there, buildings. A nice little town. We were there when the invasion was took off, and you should have heard the roar. The sky was black with the airplanes, big ones, little ones, all sizes. And here we stood outside instead of studying. We were watching what's going on. Well, it wasn't long after that that we got sent back to our quarters to Yeovil again. And then they 
took us over to Plymouth. And that's where we boarded a ship for to go across the channel, the English, English Channel. And we landed over everything. It was on 4th of July. We laid around there for quite a few days, and then we doing a little training, and they moved us forward as, as the troops, as the war moved forward. We, we moved forward with them, we stayed behind them. And that's why I say, that's the, that's the place where Buddy and I ate horse, horse meat. We don't know what the animal was dead when they found her or what, but it was butcher shop, so we thought we'd try it. But I knew right away it was horse meat. No, but he didn't. So we, we ate it, and it was good. It was a little sweeter than steak, but it was good. So now we laid there until every, my division was ready to, to, to move in. It was, we were going to take the peninsula of Prest, which was a very, very large battle. And it was, it was terrible. There was one hill. They call it the Hill 103. And it was a high hill where the Germans were right on top. They had pillboxes, bunkers, and everything. And they could see us for miles around. And trying to get up to them, it, it, was, it took us three weeks to get that hill. Once we got them off that hill, and then we had possession of, of seeing what was what, and that, that helped. And we could forward, let some divisions move forward and forward, side by side, and we'd have to clean up the Germans. That went on, it took us six weeks to clean Prest out, the pen peninsula, which was a port for all the, the submarine ships. And, the, and their stocks are all underneath a mountain. That mountain hole that reports way back in. The torpedoes go in at night, they're, they're out of sight. Uh, officers had their big, great, big mess area there. The soldiers had their big, big uh, quarters, I'd say. Everybody sleeping for it. Everything, everything was underneath the mountain. Meals and all. So we were moving forward. We got up there. One little, one little thing if not, you might want to know. We had what they called sunken roads. That was side of roads that had high banks, oh, six foot tall. And trees grew on top of them. And that's what they called hedgerows. Uh, we, I was in the, in the in sunken road. I had a German foxhole. We was getting shelled bad, and I didn't feel safe here. And my lieutenant, I looked over, and he was sitting underneath the hole that went through the bank, which was about eight foot wide, possible. I hollered at the lieutenant, "You got room for another one?" He said, "Get your butt over here." I scooted across over there and just climbed and sat down with him. And I no more left that foxhole. Another soldier jumped into it. At the same time, another shell was mopped right smack into the foxhole. There was nothing left of him. And I almost had tears just knowing that it could have been me. But I'm like, I always had a con let the conscience be my guide, and that's the way I worked. Then from then on, was, we pushed right on the forward, so that day they, the Germans gave up. We, had, we took, we took 39,000 prisoners out of that port. And think that, think that was fun. Of course, there was about three divisions of us, plenty of help. I still remember Marching the prisoners back, you know, had a whole row of them. And what guard, the whole guard, do you carry them back? Drop them off to their holding area. 
and bury the trucks and trains and everything all along. And then we laid there. After that, we laid there for, for seven, eight days and swimming in the ocean, really enjoying life. Now, they had all that good food and stuff in that, underneath that mountain. I made a trip back and I thought, well, let's get some of that. In uh, the meantime, the officers put a ban on it and you couldn't get in so much. And we come back and I walk along this one head show. And that dead German, he'd been laying there what, for 10, 12 days probably, all green, and you'd never smelled the odor that bad in your life. So I had, I had to tell somebody where, where it was, and they, they picked it up, you know, and riffled stuff up, whatever. And from then on, we went on the, on the troop train. But day and night, we went to, right to Paris and stopped, and it was just a mess. I don't know if you want to know all this, but when they had to have restrooms, there wasn't any. Somebody had to hang on your hands while you went out the door. Uh, <laughs> it was terrible. The mess was inside, inside, and you had to live with it. And we got out of Paris, and... The other way is then we got unloaded and we had trucks to haul us into Belgium. I can't name, think the name of the town, but we haul us into Belgium behind the German lines. And we stayed there about two days and then, then we moved us forward into Holland. Netherlands. That was nice. They were all friendly people, you know, there was they do anything for us. Uh, uh, Aachen was the main, main town that we were supposed to take. There was a six fuel line. And it took us a couple of weeks for line up all the divisions to get jump them. Well, you couldn't hardly get through here because everything, landmines were, you couldn't walk through. And the person that, that went through to find the mines, to get them out of the way so we could get through, you know, half the time they get killed, then you have to send somebody else in there to do it. Dangerous, very dangerous job. But the accomplished that. We finally broke through one site, and he got a division of Americans behind the Germans. And he brought from the back. Yeah, that's how that's how we got sick fuel line. They could find it from the back end while we was pushing from the front. Uh, that that took us that took us what maybe six, seven, eight days, I don't know. After that was when we then we got a what we call a break. The mission was sent back into Holland and we sat there for about a couple of weeks. And they People treated us just nice. Had a couple old ladies, a mother and two daughters. They was and the daughters were probably in the probably thirties, forties. And they'd get them to do our laundry. This stinking you know, with the dirty clothes. And they do our laundry and they'd give us something to eat what they had. Play cards. The mothers you had accordion, we the lieutenant and the first sergeant, but they'd always take me because I knew the people. They'd take me and we'd go over and we'd have a little booze, you know. She played an accordion, we'd do chicken around the floor, and then we'd be a ball. It was a sad day when we left there because that woman, they made people cry. But they enjoyed our, what we'd done. So then, we moved up toward the Ruhr River. And that was right we were after, after the Battle of Ball started. And my division, we had 90 miles of frontage along the river that we had to keep covered. The line was so thin, if, if the Germans would have tried anything there, they could have walked right through on us. But 
He threw everything they had into the battle of Paul's tomb. He was saved too. Right, and this book here is a, is a old train elevator that was all burned down. But they had a bunker underneath it, right in the round place by the brick. We hauled some straw out of there and, and stuff. That's how it. That's where we lived there for about three weeks. Then we, we had to go across that little river to Corker. Okay. I didn't think what they had. They wanted to make it as a, like a great big castle home. Bunch of buildings around the, all around the house. Plus a fence, probably about 10, 12 foot high of brick enclosed. Then they had this moat went all the way around the water, about probably 20 foot wide, maybe 15 foot deep. You couldn't walk through it, nothing. And then they had this flat, flat door that they tripped with the cables and raising the door. How would they get in and out? So we couldn't get in. So you can imagine what kind of battle we had. To, to, Anyway, I just lucky I could bypass it, my my squad. And we got, got done with the river, and we jumped into one of the amphibian tanks, what they call. It was a hollow tank where troops would jump into the tank, and that thing would go on land and water. And just our dirty luck, Germans opened up a dam. Water come all over. And this, we knew that there was mines on the other side of the, lake, of the river. And the driver would not go up with that. And we jumped out in the water up there. And I was carrying a bag of mortar ammunition with 38 pounds. I was holding that up in the air out of the water up, to, up almost by my ankle. And had my gun over the other way. And the machine gun fire, and it it's spraying us. Well, he took, he nicked my hand, just took the height off. And I couldn't duck, he couldn't duck down to get in water. And I can't swim. So my platoon sergeant, he, he got hit, but he crawled and down on, on, on the hand and knees, on the belly. He spotted where the machine gun nest was. He tossed a hand grenade in there, and he got that, knocked that out. Well, then we, we laid there, we figured out what to do. Then we got more help come across. Just a couple of amphibians got hit after us, got knocked out. Then we had the first sergeant that, that Extra, he just came back from being wounded. He was an extra first sergeant, so he was he was going to lead us in this little bitty town. And the Germans were all down in the basement. They were, they were scared. And when he, he hollered at me, he tossed a hand grenade down in there. He told him to come on out. Well, one of them got smart, and he shot. And shot this first sergeant again. Didn't kill him nothing. Just shot him up in his arm or shoulder. Then we threw a few more hand grenades down there and got rid just about all. I think four, I think four or five Germans come out. The rest of them all got killed. Well, now I guess we, we just jump, jump, you know, pick this one little town, another little town. And then we had to work our way with the great big town we called Julik. That, that was the main object. That was city bound like Grand Abbotstown was. And we went in the rough. We couldn't get in from the front riverside. So we had the soldiers get the division to go around behind again. They had a block off the main road that went from Julie to well, I can't think of the town now. Main town. Anyway, they, they come in from the valley, they close that road off. No pressure, no more Germans could come. And then we took the town. 
And of course, to me, naturally, he had his church buildings, basements, houses. I walked on one step, down the basement steps, without even paying attention. I just looked around. I looked down, I was standing on a 500 pound bomb. But it didn't explode. Thank goodness. I told him, good, cure your hair. I got gray hair going out of that out of that basement. So I, naturally, I had, a, I had to get the information too. Do the maintenance over there, and then they, they sent people down to take care of that. But that's about the main thing I remember about that. And then after that, I mean, had another break to let some of the other divisions take over. Now we moved on, moved on until they got to the town of Winston Flatbark. And that's where I see this big Nazi flag hanging on a flagpole. I decided that's something I wanted, so I just let it down, fold it up, and I still have today. That's sixty some years ago. And it's pretty, still pretty good shape. You got a couple of stains, but otherwise it's good shape. Then I took a couple of different hours. I took away there. A nice dagger. I took that away from one of them. Bayonet. I took that away. Off your, off your belts. You know. Then I had a nice big long sword, officer's sword that I picked up in the house. Some house, beautiful, nice polished up, beautiful. I think that's not be worth money if I want to sell it. But anyway, grandson don't seem to be too interested in it. Anyway, it took that flack, <laughs> then I done a naughty thing. Uh, I searched in the house, a woman had, had a radio, nice radio table model. She had it playing, and I asked her if I could borrow it to put it in my house while I was there. Well, we only stayed about three days. We still both stayed longer, but we only stayed three days. I just took the radio put it took the long one. Then we fought our way out to the Elk River, where we were supposed to meet the Russians. And we met them all right, but they, they were dirty. Well, we we was on our, our side, holding steady. They started throwing artillery shells over on our side, and amongst Americans. And I run for a new bunker. I was there. But I knew it was stacked full of barrels of gasoline. And that opening door was facing toward the Russians, which scared the heck out of me. And if a shell would have hit in there, hit them, but gasoline barrels, that would have been boo so without that, that was actually it ended up in like two days with the end of the war. We laid around for a while, just beside what was what, and he picked our division to go to Bremen, Germany. At the day of the war ended, we went in as occupation troops. We stayed there from May eighth until January. I think January 20th next year. Beautiful. I could have come home earlier, but I didn't. I liked it. So he gave me a 10 day furlough to Denmark, Copenhagen. My buddy had, uh, he was in charge of PX rationing, and he took 40 cartons of cigarettes along for black market. Plus, we each had three cartons. The first night when we stopped in the hotel, somebody broke it in my room and took one card and I would, so I only had two, which was enough, I had enough. But we sold them 40 cards and cigarettes all to one man for $40 a card. So we had spent money. Americans had a big crate, big, like a hotel, they had a big recreation room. Served free meals. 
You're allowed to take a woman past a guest. Even as a couple hundred women stand out waiting to be taken long after to eat. So you take, you just take a look at one of you figures we went to eat. And we, I lucked out to have a nice woman. Just dance and have one night of a good time and eat and drink and live my life. So then I, on the 20th of January, I got sent home. And February 17th, I got discharged. And I drove all the way back to Grand Rapids on the train. That's when I met my dog, Mitchy. When I, when I walked, got out of my car and stepped up to the rushed at me and flew right through the air and flew right in my arms and, and just licked me all over. So it's a happy dog and happy me. So I guess I don't, that's about the main thing of it. What about after you got home? What after you, I got what, home? Yeah, I, what'd you do then? Yeah, I, I worked I worked at Kelmeters before I went. Yeah, before I went. And then uh, when I was coming back, and of course my superintendent, he, he knew I was home. But my brother was foreman there, right, right where I worked. He knew I was home, so he wanted to keep calling. Give me a butt coming back to work. And I said, give me a little time. I enjoy myself. <laughs> so I guess it was about two weeks before I went to work. So I went back to work, and I worked there for 42 years. I retired from there, and here I am. I'm 80 and 90, almost 90. Oh, great big field, oh, wide open field turnips. And Germans had us pinned down. We couldn't, we couldn't come forward. I was up behind a, behind a, a one of the hedgerows, and Germans had a foxhole there, so. Quite deep, it wasn't deep enough. I made it deeper, and I stayed in there. Just when you stick your hand up to I, uh, ammunition started flying at you. Anyway, twice artillery shell landed. Just maybe I heard it here, Jennifer, outside of my hole, would explode, and it would. After shock, would just pick me right up there and drop me down. And I couldn't hear it for a couple of days. That's why I've got these right here. My eardrums are shot. But I was lucky. I'm lucky I went down before the shrapnel hit me. And another time when we first got into France, we were on the break. It was kind of like sparrow spires, little wood trees behind me. And we had foxholes all around, you know, just everybody sitting around. There's a farmhouse there. And the one woman, Celine, that night, when I asked her, she said, she could make me a meal out of rationing. Well, she, you bring them, I'll fix you something good. So I took a can of seed rising over there and, and she chopped up some potatoes and stuff and made everything up. Oh my God, was that good. So good that I went back to my foxhole and I had a nature call. And then all you do is, is squat someplace. So I was doing that and the artillery shell flew in some distance away from me. Uh, I heard that fluttering noise of a piece of shrapnel coming toward me. Don't, don't, don't ask me why, but I leaned forward. It plopped right to my, right back where I was. I just leaned forward. And it, if I wasn't really coming right now, I was saying, conscious guy, I was just 
I just, I don't know how he done that. They're trying to hide, I guess. I'm unlucky. I made it all the way through that whole war, just that little scratch. And I never went back to get my purple heart either. Because you go up, went backwards across the river, it was worse than going forward. Just he was getting shelled all over the place. Clarence, did you tell them about the bodies, how they couldn't go and pick up the bodies of your own outfit? I can't hear you, Mom. Did you tell about the bodies, how they had to lay for so long, you couldn't go in and pick up the dead soldiers? Oh, yeah, there was, there was one time, time we was going up, making the bush, and, and there was an open gate, and a bunch of soldiers went through that open gate, he was going to spread out, and they were, as we make it forward drive. And he had, Germans had booby traps set up. Where? On the flat of the ground in, in, in the weeds. Ten soldiers went in there and they all, ten of them got machine gun. They, they tricked the machine gun. The machine gun just sprayed and killed the whole ten of them. And you couldn't pick them up for ten days. You can imagine what, what it was like to try to pick them up. We couldn't leave. We had to leave them. Had to leave for details. You know, somebody else pick them up. No fun doing that stuff. I don't know. Oh, one time they, they had me drowned. In Bremen, in the in the Weser River. And he said that that German speaking fellow. They found him dead. So everybody had come and look, they looking for me. It wasn't me. It was it just happened to be a Jewish fellow like that uh, could speak German. Mm -hmm. What what he done? He doing that river? I don't know. They found floating in the water. That was after the war was over. Did Clarence tell you he was interpreter? You were interpreter because you could speak German to a certain extent. Of course, it's different high German and low oh, German. No, no, no. Oh, I, I had to be an interpreter for two soldiers that raped, raped a woman. A girl. And the worst thing was that they made the mother and the young young sister watch while two of them raped this woman. Well, thank the Lord, the woman came to the company. And uh, first I had to interpret. I, you know, I, I had to tell them. And speak slow. If you speak slow, I can understand most of what you're saying. So he told me what happened. Then I had it transferred over to, to the captain and the colonel that was there. And they, no, no, they, I got him off by land. I told him, I said, the captain, the colonel says, we will take care of them. They will get their punishment. Did you ever hear what happened to them? They, they got punished. For, they had to stay right in the area. They couldn't leave. No, they could nothing. But they had to pull guard duty every day. I think it was 10 or 12 days. They didn't like it. They didn't like me. But I said, if I wouldn't have done that, you probably got court martial. Yeah, and you have to use what do it to hang him. I got him off that day. I, said, I never really felt, I felt guilty in the innocent way, but I didn't want to see people get hung either. No, but you were interpreter for other to other officers and so forth with their with the German with the ones that couldn't speak German. Oh yeah, when we take prisoners, you know, I always had interpreters, yeah. But 
but there was nothing, nothing fancy. We just, just tried to get him lined up with where we were going to take him. There was one officer, he, he had a box because he got cigars. And I loved them German cigars. So we had to search him. Well, I found that box of cigars in his bag. So I took that, and he, oh, he got mad at me, and he, went, <laughs> he wanted the cigars. And I said, well, I'll share it with you. I took a handful, and I gave the box back. <laughs> oh, he, he was mad at me. He said, I can't buy them. I can't get them now. Tough. Well, you still the different letters in that, but um, <laughs> they had to go without. Suffer. So I don't know. You might think some other stuff. But Did he cover basically what you had questions or not? Not yet. Just a couple questions. Yeah, just just a, a, a couple. Um, friendships. Did you stay close with anybody? Um, meet anybody that you stayed with in from um, Fort Benning on? Or? Yeah. No, Fort Benning. No. And then nobody went with me in my division. I'll, I'll take that back. Jim one, one, Ford, he went. He went to A Company of 116th Infantry, and I went to 115th Infantry. But I never did see him. But I did bypass Don Swartz one night. We had to go and replace their division. And all we was walking. I say, Swartz, 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 you know, I figured if he in there, he'd hear me, because nobody else was talking. But evidently, he wasn't in that group. But they were in the same area at the same time and were unaware of each other yeah. at that time. Yeah. Because I didn't, I didn't, I knew he was in that 28th Division. I was getting rid of letter from reading them. But you kept in contact with Jimmy Ford and that other sergeant. Oh yeah, my my platoon sergeant. After you came yeah, home, we went to their he's house. He's in uh, Chrisfield, Maryland. And my, my, we took a trip out there after the war. And we <laughs> went to their house. He, they owned a nightclub. Yeah, they only run at nights or weekends or whatever it was. And then we, uh, he took us, on Sunday he took us over to their house for soft shell crap dinner. And uh, want to tell them how stupid. We didn't know nothing how to eat then. And they didn't eat with us. They just. He just fixed me and I cooked crab and gave put one whole crab on the on the, on the place. So we ate the whole thing, the guts and all. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was sick all the way back to Washington D.C. that day. Uh, the, we both were. Now who was that? That was in Crestfield, Maryland. They they wouldn't they wouldn't correct us, didn't tell us nothing. So we just we just ate it. I still don't know how you eat soft shell crabs. Do you? <laughs> Never had them since. But the, the father was a, what do you want to call it, a dealer in seafoods. And they were doing us this big treat, this very special thing, having us, feeding us this. So you're going to eat it if somebody's doing this, just going out of their way and doing this for you. But who, who was that? You said that was your platoon sergeant? Yeah, my platoon sergeant. What, he, was, his, uh, what was his name? Uh, Jimmy Ford. And he, uh, one time he was in a, in a battle. We had a little Italian kid. He, he, he was out on, in front of everybody at night. Out, what they call the outpost. And... Uh, at radios, and you could hear him, hear him when he was snoring. He's supposed to be awake, and here he was snoring. So, 
Ford, Jimmy Ford, he was going to stick me in, replace with him, and send me there. I said, Sergeant, uh, you were going to put me there. I said, I'd, I'd probably be dead before morning. Unless my nerves wouldn't dig it. Okay, no problem, he said. He said, you're doing a good job here. I talked myself out of that. I, you know, you go out in front, you're all alone. The Germans walk by and you know. I said, no, no. Then you had to get behind German lines yet besides, you know, see what they were up to. Then they had to come back to the German lines again. What the fun? I, I, I never had to do that. Lucky for me. I guess the good Lord was there watching out for me. My mother, I was her, her boy. She wanted me back. And I have you walk out, walk out, you know him, Judy's. And Judy's husband, Walter Geiser. He was in Little Rock, Arkansas, Fort Camp uh, Robinson, where I went. And I. Him and I and Judy went. We spent New Year's together. What was it? Let's see, I forgot what that was. Let's see. Look at all. There are whole things up here. I, I, I can't think of what I was going to say here. All I do know is. And he come home as I went down there, and I said, uh, I was supposed to draw unemployment, and General Motors didn't want to pay it. And when he came back, he had six paychecks for me for $25 paychecks. So that's when I had all my, 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 picture, my pictures taken for the whole family. Each one got a picture. Oops. That's as far as I need to think right now. Let me change your batteries real quick, bud. They, they were for, forced into me in there. And if you could tell that the ones that gave up quick, if you get in battle, they would, they would surrender real fast. Because they knew they would get sent back. It couldn't be any worse in, in America than it was fighting battles. They were told that Americans were nasty people and all that stuff. You know. they would, we, if you take them back there, we're going to you know, get rid of them right away instead of feeding them. And before I went overseas, I had, I had a whole bunch of prisoners. I, I used to take them out, do the labor that we used to do labor. And they were they was happy to do it. Because you got the free meals. Now, were you already married when you went? No. No? So you got married when you got back? I got married. Uh, I come back in February, February 17th, and we get married November 15th. Deer hunting season day. <laughs> I didn't hunt that year. <laughs> Good for you. You got your deer. The D-E-A-R. Oh, there you I go. had my games I didn't know. I found. How'd you stay in touch with um, with the people back here? Uh, female. Female. Uh, female. It's one sheet, of, one sheet of paper. You just write that down. When you lay on that on one sheet of paper, fold it up. Before we come home, they had to check it. As though no information got out. And that would be initialed by certain officers that had done it. And you received lots of lines that were blacked out, and it was photographed, so by the time you got it, it was this size. Mm -hmm. Was it that small? Yeah. That small. I 
wish I had brought one along. I know I got some somewhere yet. Did you ever hear of V-mail? Yeah, I mean, one time I tried to typewriter. If we went in the house and had a the room enough to typewriter behind it. So I sat for three, four days. I wrote her, typed her a letter. Still got that one? Probably. Three or four days, huh? Yeah. I'd usually get, get through eating, just go back, sit down. You know, I had a bunch of one finger. I wasn't. I was no secretary or nothing like that. But well, I did not think to pass time. Like what? You find, well, I done a lot of reading. I always carried a pocketbook with no client in my pack. And if, if I get to where, where you stay for a while, I'd sit there and I'd read. And I still do it today. I read, I read every day. Now, where did you get the books? Now I get in what, well, back Goodwill then, stores. The army furnishing? Where'd you get them back then? Oh, they, they, they had a library that, that followed you. Uh, Red Cross, they followed you with, with the, they'd have books. You'd love to have one or two books, you know. But I never did like Red Cross. There's, there's one time they come up there, they wanted some cigarettes. They wanted 50 cents back for them. I wouldn't buy them. They're supposed to be free. Yeah, pay for your Some way mm -hmm. they they was gonna to try to make a little money on the, on the soldiers. I told you to shuffle. Now, did the same people stay with the Red Cross the whole time? That we don't know. Okay, so I mean, so you, did you ever have good experiences with them too? I'm sure. Oh, general, they, they, they bring us. They bring us a movie, stuff like that, you know, and, and we go way behind the line. You sit out in the field, they put up battery operated the movie cameras. And they show us a whole movie or something like that. Or we'd have a lot of actors, actresses come over. Did you meet anybody famous? Oh, yeah. I, I, I never got to talk to them, but I mean, I was here in the, in the crowd. Like who? You, oh, Jesus. Don't ask me that question. Wasn't Bob Hope one of them? Who? Bob Hope. Oh, yeah, Bob Hope was there a couple of times. He was right by close to my living quarters. We had a big night club there. And I got so I wouldn't even go see him. I saw him so often I didn't go back to see him. But there was a nice place. They had, they had dances every Saturday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And it was fun to have the German girls fight over it to see who was going to, who was going to get to dance with you next. <laughs> it got so bad, they had some guys that get so jealous that they give all the time to and they didn't fight. I heard one guy got hit so hard, knocked down, his head hit the curb. And you only heard the most deathly sound of crack. Crack the skull. That's a scary man. It ain't even worth it. Fight over who you're going to dance with. So, who was your best friend when you were, when you were serving? Did you have one? Well, not necessarily not just one special because they change so much. You, know, you lose them. Because I had this one in London Rex, I had I mean, he was with me all the time. He was, he was a pretty good friend. He's the one that one night had that radio in Bremen. We had this house and we, we had the downstairs and he had the upstairs area, the living room area. He we wired that radio up so he had speakers upstairs. He was he was a smart guy. Louisiana Swamp Rat, was he with you overseas? Louisiana Swamp Rat, was he with you overseas? Oh, no, not he didn't go with me. He was here in the States. Sergeant Nectel? Uh, Nectel was my, yeah, he was my lieutenant. 
Now we start to see it here in Pennsylvania. We stayed there, well, we stayed what, overnight? Real, he was a real, he was German speaking because of he and he liked me because I get I do I had to do the dirty work for him. Big German. He wasn't a good either. He was, he was just like I was Benjamin in Dutch. Half English, half German, you know. And he's the one over he he could he get a bottle of booze a week. All officers got a bottle of booze a week. And the first thing you do is come by a squat or the section. You pass the bottle around. Everybody could drink for you did. But nobody took more than, 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 than maybe a teaspoon of that much. It was just the idea. Everybody got a drink with him. And he, he got mad enough with that much left for him with a couple of good drinks. And what was his name again? Lieutenant Nectel. Carl, Carl Nectel. It was K A R L. Carl. Carl. Carl Nectel. K N E C. He got married just before we went to see him. And a nice wife. I don't remember her name. You, do you remember her name? I don't remember her name. No. Probably got her home on pictures. Huh? Probably got her home on some pictures, but I don't remember her name no. now. The pictures upstairs in the attic, and it's just a hell of a place where I go to look for them. I got a lot of coins up there, German money, Dutch money, English money. Stuff's all laying around up there someplace. So you were able to keep in touch with some of the guys afterwards? No. Not just the just the ones that you were talking about that just you stopped at their place, but not not for very long. The two uh, two that I went to Copenhagen with, one was in Muskegon, one in Washington State, and we went to Camp what Indiana, Camp Atterbury. That's where I got discharged, and so that we oh well, the one from Muskegon, the year old with me on the train. Far as Holland, yeah, Holland. Then they from Holland. I, I went to Grand Rapids, and he went to Muskegon. But the last I heard of him. How long were you serving with him? Oh, he was there practically most of the whole time. He was a good guy, really a good guy. Why do you think you lost lost contact with with some of those guys? Well, people had different kind of lives, I guess. They just went back to the old ways, and they just forgot. I mean, but you know, you try to forget what you've done. Me, I'm a lucky guy, but I don't know if I ever killed anybody. But I probably did, because I put the mortar shells like that. They drop a shell in, and it would fly. And I'd explode. And them little mortar shells, they would break up little pieces of steel. And I got some reason, I got a picture of the priest, the chaplain. I seen him get killed, watched him get killed, just as he got out of the jeep, was going to go into the, he was going to go into the house. Gotta be back for them. There's a big church right here. I I climbed way up in that steeple. That church. Is See that where the gunman was? In that duplicate Clarence, is that the steeple where one of the German gunmen was firing? Yeah. But they, we used, they used to drive and take, to take churches. By, by the way, I was walking in. When we joined 
29th Division. Lieutenant right there, he was, we were replacements. We had to replace somebody that was missing. So he got down with two of his left guys. When he said, I got two spots, one for the runner, one for mortar. I said, just that quick. I said, I'll take mortar. Okay, he says, you had mortar in. He told the snipe man, never forget his name, last name Snipes. He got to be a runner. And the first battle, we, well, this is the battle we went down to the churches. I go down the old big open field. I walked by his body. They could have been me. And he was sent. He was sent out to do it, deliver a message, which he never made. And in that same field, I was lucky again. Uh, Germans had a nice big foxhole built up with a wooden door over the top, dirt piles over the top. And nice door, dirt, and they just lived in there for quite a while. So I was in there, you know, and I thought, well, that's a nice place to sit. And pretty soon there was a rumble to close, and I kind of stuck my head and looked, and here come our, one of our big tanks coming right straight. So if they're sitting down the hole, they didn't see me. Drove right smack over the top of that foxhole. If I'd have been in there, I wouldn't be here. But I mean, just little things like that, you know. It happens to, to me, uh, I call, I'm lucky. Good Lord was there and helped me out. And don't think for a minute, I didn't do a lot of praying. Bet you a lot of people back here were praying for you, too. Oh, yeah, like the mom said, that helped, too. But I, I prayed every chance I get, you know. But then when you get pulled off the front, the front line, you come back. You felt relaxed, you know, like you just en enjoy yourself. You do something, anything you can do, enjoy yourself. Because we done a lot of card playing. Match sticks for a poker, you know, we just, you just, just the idea of doing something. But when I was in, in, in uh, Bremen, Part of my division go home, you know, the people that go home, they would give me their ration cards. I had a whole stack of ration cards. That's where I made my money. I go every day, I go two, three times, I go to PX. I get a whole supply of everything I could get that would come with that ration. You can walk down maybe half a block or a block. Truman stand there with two hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. He gave me the ration. It cost me fifty cents. And why would why would they want to buy that stuff? Oh, they didn't have nothing. They get a whole carton of cigarettes. Oh my God, they go crazy for that, you know. Plus soap, coffee, shaving goods, all all that stuff was in that in that package of ration. Now, were these people that lived, these weren't other soldiers, these were just people that lived in the towns? The German people, no. The most, mostly older people. They were, in my book, not Nazis. Nazis, they, they had that guilty look, or uh, strutting. You know, like they want to strut, you know. Them was the ones we, we never paid attention to. But if I go in place at night, I never went. I had my pistol. I, I kept that. I found that one time we had to go up to. Had to be a. I had to be a German-speaking man in and, and a. Uh, I was a French. We had to go up on the mountain. And. Clean the houses, a couple of big houses out, and we had to clean them out for, for any guns, ammunition, anything up that they could use to hurt the eyes. Did people live in these houses still? Oh, they they're up in there. See, they were just lucky they didn't, wasn't damaged. And we passed a woman. <laughs> I still see that. A woman was coming down that road. We passed her there, so we were going up there. So we, 
kids they had to leave us in the house. No, we had, we asked for all the guns and ammunition. I says, you got any pistols? Oh yeah, don't you ever try to hide? We got pistols, give them up. They had a nice little brand new 32 Mauser. That beautiful little pistol. Everything else got turned in, but that didn't. Still have it? No, I sold it to a guy before I left. Before I got home. I got $200 for it. And I said, I don't want to get stuck with a pistol. I might do things to you because, you know, going through war, you, you probably wouldn't think twice before you shoot. I said, I don't want that responsibility. So I, I, I sold it to the guy. Oh, he was happy. But I carried that every night. I go in many places. I go. I walk alone in the dark. I just I that in my hand. Never had to use it. But I think it was so accurate. We get that little pack of cigarettes, four cigarettes in the pack. It come in your ashes. Like I said, the empty carton out there was about 20, 30 feet of maybe a little more than that. I just keep that pistol and shoot. That hits about every time. I used to have to go along with communication, German communication people that would be repairing electric lines, telephone lines and stuff, and I'd have to go along with them, protect them so nobody would bother him. That'd be one of my jobs. And I, I do a lot of shooting. He says, oh, yes, you are good. He says, I said, it's a good gun. He said, yeah, it's a good gun. And it was. So you, you don't think that you ever, that you know of, you you didn't shoot any, you weren't forced to shoot anybody? No, no, I never, I never put a gun up at, at anybody. That's when I say I feel so good for that it don't ever hurt me. Just know that I, you know, like I say, I, I probably killed somebody with the murders that went up over. I probably did, but I don't know that. I never know if I killed anybody. That's why I wanted more of the section rather than, than the infantry, infantry rival. Only time I remember shooting the rival one morning before we make a jump off. Everybody that went head through, we had to get it up and shoot two clips of ammunition and shoot in that direction. Scare the Germans, you know. Maybe they could take off running if they heard all that shooting. You heard you had to do that every morning? No, we just done that one time. That's, that's the only time I ever shot that gun. Except for in training. I shot that gun we had on a rifle range, and one morning they had one, one, of, one of the buddies, I can't even think of it, that's on Georgia. We had to go out on the, on the firing range. So in the, in the morning, I was down there, I was marking the targets. You'd, you'd be behind the high bank, you know, and then the big square target goes up, then you have a round disc. You let them know where that bullet hit, you know. So I done that in the morning. And then I knew, knew when we take a lunch break, we had lunch there. They brought just like a chow line you know, to get food. And in the afternoon, I had a shoot. Stand up once, first, first shot, standing. Then you lay in the belly. And you had to shoot eight more times. And the target went up there and kept doing that bullseye, bullseye. Eight times for the ninth down, they couldn't find. They said that had to go through one of the other holes. So I come back. My lieutenant gave me money for buy a bottle of booze. He gave me a three day pass. Me and the score keeper. So we went down to Rizal. <laughs>
and you never had to use that skill? No. No. But I, as of today, I am still good. Good shot. I'm pretty good for shooting. Mm -hmm. Since I shoot in that turkey, and I just pulled right up the side and chopped down there better now. Well, I think we're going to have to go to the So, when you got home, was there people meeting you at the train? Was there a. Did nobody, you... made, nobody made me. They didn't know it coming. I just come home, got off the train, got a taxi, and he'd run out to Brother John's house. And of course, he was at work. So the train's got the phone call down to have him bring the car home. And in 1937, Plymouth. So I took that car, and of course, I first went down to see her first thing. You didn't go long on home, did you? No. Then we drove out home and on the farm. You shot me. You came into the office. It was a good show for the whole office. What? Since you, it, was, it was quite the shock when you walked into her office. Uh, I always have heard, yeah. Did your mom throw you a big party? No, I guess she didn't. Not when he came home, he had a big one before he left. Yeah. There were two uncles at home on the furlough. They were in the door. It used to be a tavern there, we had dances in it. They'd been rented that hall, furnished all the beer and all that. And they had one hell of a big gang party. All my relations, all in her relations. The two of her uncles put that on. George, Uncle George and uh, Uncle Paul. George. No Walt? The whiskey. Yeah. That was Mary Whiskey's husband's brother. He helped put it on there. And brother in law. Well, he, he, him, and I liked it. Because we was invited to a wedding up north to her. So, how long were you in the Army altogether? 39 and a half months. Long time, but I can't say I, I didn't like it. I, uh, naturally, I didn't like the battle, but with the grace of God, I pulled through it. So I was happy ever after. But I did have a lot of nightmares. For my fact, I still do once in a while. And I, but I never, never shoot anybody. Yeah, I'd run across the German prisoners, see the prisoners. They coming at me, they gonna shoot me. And I don't shoot and they don't shoot. But shells fly around some place, Alice you hear them. Uh, I guess I'm pretty well talked out for as far as I know. What was your rank? What was your rank? Just a private first class, one straight. And that's another deal. I went to motor mechanic school in Georgia. And when they sent me back to my company, I was supposed to go to work in the motor pool as a sergeant, with a sergeant stripe with a T underneath. I worked there one day. New, new order come out, T.O. they call it. We had one mechanic to a company and already had one mechanic. So I missed out on that one. So then when man of war, after everything around there, I finally got to be a jeep driver for the captain. After his record driver went home, and I drove, I guess, probably four or five weeks, maybe six weeks. And he says, boy, he says, for an infantry man, you're one hell of a driver. You know, he liked the way you, you drive better than my regular driver did. 
He said, you don't take the gamble of chances. Well, I said, I said, I learned driving when I was about 15, 16 years old. And I told him what I'd done. I was going to, I had to go up to New Salem Church and catechism on Saturdays. And my brother Nick had an old 1927 Ford touring car. It had sight curtains on it. And he had it parked on New Salem store. And him and Agnes Miller's husband, they had went fishing. So my brother, my brother Ed and Louise and I came back from catechism. Since Louise dared me, I dare you to drive that thing home. Hmm, I can do it. So I know how to set the, you had a thing, what he called you, you had to set a magneto in one place and then pull the gas lever down so far. And you go out and crank it. Well, as I crank and didn't start away, and then a milk truck driver come out. Oh, I was pleased. Hey, let me crank that for you. He cranked it and then showed me how to how to put the gas throttle and everything out of the back of him. Took off, drove the thing home, back to the yard. And about an hour later, here come Nick walking, the damn little stinker. We used different words. And he laughed. He said, you go all right? I said, I'm here. <laughs> well, at least that's the way I learned. So, but now, I, I, I drove Brother John. He had a Ford Coupe. I drove that a little bit. And then he bought a 1928 Whippet. I drove that a few times. But then when he got married, he had a 1928 Pontiac. And uh, he sent me home to do the chores. And of course, he took this mile right straight across behind. So I had to go around the no-sale store. Go home. And go home, milk the cows, and then, then come back. And then we had to go up, up north door. Tavern, the upstairs, where they had the weddings, dancing. That's where we went. But I didn't have no trouble driving the car. And he's still a good driver today. Yeah. That's why press surrendered. That the German officer, they coming back, showing our officers and talk things over. That's a train that, that they had over there. G.I. had to get on that thing and write it on. This, this is a fort they had. Everything just loaded with artillery guns all the way around. They had they had pages every way. And this that's the inside buildings. Here's where you want to cross that moat. There's the water moat right there. Oh, that's a, that's the place you were talking about. Yeah, they asked me for you to go across. What what country was that? That's by Impress, Impress France. Here's the prisoners. That's how they how they came out. They tried to surrender. They carried that white flag. When they when they had a white flag, you didn't dare shoot. There's a bunch of prisoners here. Before they would take, the, take them back to the headquarters, with our big officer, our big officer, were, they would point for them. So they wouldn't have nothing to take back in case they didn't make peace. So this is the land of Germany. That's where we start fighting right in here. 29th Division is in this area here. Right by Aachen. And this little line here is the Ruhr River. Gildenkirchen, I was in that little town for quite a while. And Julik is, Julik is how they pronounce it. 
Oh, yeah. That between, that to me, I between, and, and Cologne. I went to Cologne once, so we got that great big Catholic church. Very beautiful way one there. I went to buy it, but it's not. Dusseldorf, that was, it had a coal mine. And that's where we go take our showers. Yeah, that was nice. Once a week, we'd go and have a shower. Truckloads. Our chaplain, a priest. I saw him get killed when he, stopped, when he walked in there. What? How did? Where was he when he got killed? Hirschberg. Was it? Was it in the middle of a battle? Or no, was it? no. He was going to go walk in. And in. He came from wherever he was, with his quarter, or come into the our company. And he was just going to walk into the, was a German house, which, which we had taken over for for our headquarters. He just jumped out of his jeep and started in the mortar shell drop right there and got him. Hoshman felt good. That's where that big building where I told you where the whole thing is enclosed. And with right with there, the moat and everything? The moat, yeah, that's the moat. And right about here, where the line is, that's where I crossed the Ruhr River. Right there. And right, right there's a machine gun nest right in here by the road. And after we got, my sergeant knocked that out. Then we went up there to this little town, Bruce, Bruce or something like that. Then we have to hit that, and then we come. Here's that big town facility that we had. Had to take over. That was that was quite a good battle. I guess this was the end of the war. Did you find it in there where they had them big, thick walls? How many inches thick? Tell them. Reinforced cement. I just talking about the hospital gut, you know. Oh no, he's talking about the pillboxes. Yeah. Oh, that was impressed. Tell her about that. Just on top of on top of the uh, mountains. Where the GIs had to climb up the wall to get up to it. They had pillboxes. Cement, thick, real thick cement, and 14 inches of steel. That's how thick it was. And some police knew, I don't know where it be, but they showed the picture of, of all them shells right, hitting it now, I'm going to think, I must be back to the first one. It had holes. Puncture right in it, you know. With, you know. Can't find it. But they were safe because no, no ammunition of any kind could pierce through that. There's artillery shell here, just make, it, just make a little hole in the cement. All they would do. But they couldn't yeah. get through the steel. So the Germans were well prepared for that war. Oh, yeah, they sure were. And the way they had all their headquarters and everything hewn out of the rock in the sides of the mountain and stuff, they were. This is, this is where your submarines were in. Why not down underneath the mountain? They couldn't get out of here because we had our ships. And everything there they had that area all covered that you couldn't get out. And it was way at 30, 39,000 years up. That's a lot of prisoners. Mm -hmm. It had to be big. I never got inside it to see what it was. That's the song for the old. What is that? 
That's what you call a sunken road, see? High bank here on one side and high on this side. There, there's a German truck knocked out of whack and German tank. Here's our GIs trying to get, get across against that wall. And that's one of those places where you found that little hole and you got into? Yep. No. Or this one was it, no. I mean up against one of the walls? Like something like that. You know, on the it didn't have the hard rock. Oh. It was just it was just dirt. It's like a regular crown, you know. That's how they they pile the dirt up. I don't know, somebody you see them. Oh, I don't know, I can't explain what I want. Well, like here's one thing, you can see all the fields. Those are all different fields right there. You, you, you think that looks small? But that's a big field, probably 20, probably 20, 30, 30 acres. Each one different. And like the hatch drills down there. This is all the hatch drills down there. There's no hatch drills in here. It's hard to tell that, that those are trees. But it's digging it from up, up pretty high. Did he tell you how he was in the turnip fields and all he ate was turnips? Uh, well, that's the same place where I got, got shell shop. I never cooked turnips. <laughs> well, I tell you, the raw turnips are good. They have not eaten for two days. So, the raw turnips taste pretty good. I knew him. What happened to him, do you know? He just got killed. During the war? Yeah. What happened, do you remember? Where? What happened, do you remember? No, I really don't happen to the circumstances. But I just know he got killed and he was a very popular sergeant. Okay. I, find what I, want. I got a holy water fountain that I got home in my bedroom. What is it? Holy water fountain. You know, just, just a little place we have it. Oh, it's just like a little cup, but they didn't fill a little holy water in there. And they nights you go in, you used to cross yourself. And you got that from Germany? Yeah, in France. France. From West France. I just happened to see that thing hanging on the wall, so I took it. So, how much stuff did you bring home? Not a whole lot. Not like that, I brought that home. I didn't, I didn't let that get away because I, I wanted that. That is a big flag. Yeah. What, about four by eight? Yeah, four by eight. Um, what are some of the battles? The Battle of Brest. R E S T? How do you spell it? Do you know? B B R E S T. That's a big peninsula. Huge. Uh, and then there was the. Ziegfried Line. Ziegfried Line. Z I E G F R I E D. Okay. Battle of. Oh God Almighty. You said Battle of the Bulge, too, didn't you? Pardon? Did you say Battle of the Bulge? No, I didn't. I, I was lucky that I didn't see it in that. But uh, we held. Our division held a 90 mile width along the river. That's how thin, thin we were spread out. And, and where was that? I was in Coleslaughter, but the rest of them I don't know. It was all the way along Ruhr River. R O H R, Ruhr River. Yeah, the rest of you, every, everybody else was in the Battle of Bulls, and we were just laying there hoping, hoping the Germans didn't make attack. 
because we never went and many will stop them. Because only back in we had was a couple of artillery shells, artillery pieces behind us. No tanks, or nothing. What would you say are special duties or achievements or highlights or something? I would, I've uh, ended up being record truck driver. Okay. I had the whole breakdowns back, back to ordinance department. You couldn't drive it, Mike? I finally thought the name ordinance. I think that's spelled that right. And didn't you say you were, um, what is the word I'm looking for? A translator? No, oh, interpreter. Interpreter. Yeah, interpreter. So, Clarence, if there was one lesson, life lesson you took out of, out of being in active duty in World War II, could you, could you narrow it down, or is that too hard? <laughs> don't be a Nazi, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> as, far as, as far as I know, and what I've learned is just, I learned how to protect my life and the soldiers next to me, anybody next to me that I help. And you learn how to shoot a mean turkey? No. <laughs> I, I, shot, I learned how to, this is the first one I ever shot. Really? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. 89 years old and you bagged your first turkey? Yeah. I, went, I told Jim I'm going to hunt until I'm 100. He laughed at me. He's a good editor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Line on him. He calls it yes, I still shot a deer yet last year. There was no buck, but it's not no. Now, were you a good shot going into the army, or did you get better be in the army? Oh, better. You got to get the training. Yeah, he really learned uh, how to sight gun. And you don't, you don't jerk trigger it, you squeeze it. But mostly you said you, you did mortar. That was, that was kind of your big thing. Is you, that, you... that was my, that was my uh, classification, mortar. I wasn't a rebel man, no, but I just mortared. And I was happy as that. Like, mortared, you backed. The only hype I had building is up. And they're going to put it in their files. So, like, oh, 200 yeah. years from now, they can come back and look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is what happened. You're going to be famous, Clarence. You're going to be famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, at 90 years old, I'm famous.